So trying to, as you develop, as you actually start to develop your own product, you have to figure out like, what are the requirements? And, um, you know, I finally figured out what's the most economical way to um, use the yardage of fabric to determine what size bag you're going to have or um, ah. how to help my seamstresses be more productive so they don't have as many pieces to have to put together because the more pieces you have to put together, the longer it takes them. Welcome to the Artist Appeals. How are you? I'm good. I'm very good. Guys, meet Jennifer. Yeah. Jennifer is the owner, designer, creator of a two by tandem, Nespa. Tandem for two. Tandem for two. I always want to call it if two by tandem. <laughs> two if by C maybe, but yeah, no, yes. tandem for two. It was named after my son came up with the name. It's named, we have an orange 1968 vintage tandem bike and he we were talking about logos and names and he said, you have to come up with something clever and thanks son. Yep. I realize he was 13 <laughs> at the time. So he said, you know, you should do something with our, that tandem bike that you just got. Yeah. So I got the wheels spinning and sure enough, I came, I thought, Oh, he said tandem for two, that would be a cool name. And it actually worked really well because my whole brand and everything that I design is about hometown pride and, loving where we live, celebrating where we live and where life takes you. And that tandem bike, when I first got it, it came from a Midwest farmer's barn. Right. He had used it for his whole family and grandkids Aww. had outgrown it. And so I, and I got it because my daughter couldn't reach pedals on a normal tag along bike. So she could prop up her little feet and we could ride in our beach town and go to the farmer's market or go for picnics, which we do. And my husband and I still ride the bike today, even though that little girl is now 20. So we've had Aww. it a long time. Oh, I love that story. Thank you yeah. so much for sharing that. That's fantastic. So um, I want to start out with five or maybe even six rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Sure. All right. What is your number one top selling piece of art, product, style, or design? What is your, what is your number one? The number one of all time were my pillows. I sell um, bucket list pillows. So number one seller, they're all different towns, states, and they celebrate all the fun things about that community or that state. And so that by far, the first year that I started selling them, I had sold and sewed a thousand of them at my wow. kitchen counter. And within a year, I thought, this is crazy. I can't keep up because then that second summer, um, I was almost on my way to another thousand just in the summertime. Wow. So it had snowballed and other towns had started picking them up. Other uh, stores were selling them. I was selling wholesale too. So I brought on a seamstress and gosh, over the next five years, I didn't even count. I lost count of how many <laughs> thousands of pillows that we sold. Oh so that is God. by far my number one bestseller. Second would be my mugs too. I do mugs often, so thousands of them. So yeah. That is phenomenal. That is so cool. Okay. So that leads us to number two. What okay. is your one thing, the the best thing you love to make or create or do? Like, what is it that you just love doing in your business? What's your favorite thing? I now get to, now that I've changed my business structure, I've gotten out of manufacturing everything myself. And so now I get to sit and have a lot more time to sit and draw. So sitting on my porch with my dog next to me, he doesn't, he's always by my side. I sit there and I draw all day and draw patterns and surface pattern designs and um, just create, try different things still trying to find different, I, I'm all over the place with my style. So I'm still trying to hone in on what really is, what makes me, me. So, um, I, I love, love that you just that. said that, that you're still trying to hone in on your style because you have such a distinct style and voice. Oh, and I, I think it's really neat to share with people that like, even somebody as established and, and, you know, we're always looking for our style. It's like a constant, never ending thing. And it's nice of you to say that because I don't feel like I 
know my style. I mean, I, <laughs> well, I got, well, cause I'm all over the place. I've got, you know, this typography type art and then I've got, you know, gouache designs and then I've got, now I'm doing patterns. And so it just feels sometimes, some days I feel like I'm all over the place trying different, <laughs> cause I like to try different things. I'm always curious and um, yeah, just, I like trying different things. So I think that's the nature of being an artist for sure. Is- that exploration. Covering that. Yeah. But I just think it's really cool that you said that, you know, because oh. I think we all feel it and we all think, oh, well, we can't start until we find our style. And that's maybe the furthest thing from the truth. I've been doing this almost 10 years. So I didn't wait <laughs> to find my style. <laughs> I kind of just jumped in. Don't wait, guys. Just nope. jump in. Good advice. Okay. So if that's what you love to do, it sounds idyllic. Honestly, it sounds so sublime. But then what's the thing you hate to do? What's the thing you dislike doing the most? Out of all the hats that I wore in my business, and I wore a lot of different hats, the I can do it, but I would much rather not do the accounting. So <laughs> I got to the point where, I mean, I have a back. I'm an engineer. So I've got that math background. I can do it, but accounting is a whole different kind of math. And that takes a special person. (laughs) And I just did not look forward to, to going through the books and closing out the books every month. And so I have a saint of a husband and he, as I was about to hire someone, he said, you know what, let me just take a crack at him. And he's an engineer also, but he's got more of that accounting kind of mind. So right. he's been doing my books for me for several years, which is honestly just lovely to not have to worry about them. <laughs> yeah, I'm fortunate. No doubt. Okay. So what's the funniest or weirdest experience you've ever had? Regarding my business or yeah, or design or uh, art, selling your art. Cause sometimes I talk mm-hmm. to the artists and there's something funny that's happened to them. Like Don Mates dropped a couple of paintings off of his car in oh. the road, like drove away with them. They were like on oh. the roof. Like, what's the weirdest, funniest story? The weirdest thing, weirdest, but very cool. It was very unexpected. Yeah, I was at my second gift show. I had done a gift show in New York city and this was, then I decided to go to Atlanta. I had set up a temporary booth. It was the first time that I was in Atlanta ever at the gift show. And my husband and I are hanging out and it was early first day, very early. So nobody's, you're meeting your neighbors. Nobody's really walking around yet. And a woman walks by and she literally stopped. She started to go forward and then she stopped again And she looks at my booth and she said, well, you are just perfect. (laughs) And that caught me off guard. And I'm like, okay. And she said, you fit with our brand so well. Have you ever thought about licensing? And it had, I didn't even really, honestly, I know kind of what licensing was, had no idea of the particulars, didn't know how to go about it. Ended up over the next several days, went up to their little showroom They were a small company that did dog accessories. That was their whole brand was dog bowls and leashes and placemats and collars and bandanas, the whole bit. And they ended up, they licensed a dog bucket list for all the things about a dog's life from a dog's perspective. And so it was an odd request. (laughs) But it was really fun to illustrate. And I just had a really good time with it. And it was my first licensing deal. And come to find out, they hadn't licensed very often either. So they didn't really know what they were doing either. So it worked out right. great. We both kind of <laughs> learned together and trial um, by fire. Right. It worked out. But it was just out of the blue, bizarre, not expected, but really fun. That's cool. That's very cool. Okay. So. What is one most important piece of advice? If you were starting it out again today, Hmm. what is the piece of advice that you'd give your younger self? It's kind of an atypical question, but I think there's a lot to. Don't be afraid to call myself an artist. Mm. It took me years to get to the point. I'm an engineer by training. I did freelance graphic design from college on. So uh, took 
a couple painting classes because I was curious when I first moved to our community. We live in a real artsy community. Um, so I took an oil class and then I took a watercolor class and an acrylic class and just to, I was curious. I had never, um, I was always creative growing up, but I didn't even see myself that way. Um, Mm -hmm. it wasn't that art was discouraged, but it was never encouraged when I was growing up. It was kind of, yeah, you dink around and I sewed with my mom and, you know, I just, nobody talked about that being artistic or creative and it just was um, right. something to do. But even when, you know, when I first moved to this community and took those classes, it was just something to try. I just didn't see it as part of myself. And yet I had always taken photographs. I was very much into photography since I was a teenager. And so there were these aspects to me that were very creative and artistic, but I just didn't see them that way. So it was easier for me to say that I was a graphic designer or I was a product designer once I started right. developing products. And um, finally, it was somebody, cha- I can't even remember how it came about, but someone challenged me like, no, you're an artist. And mm. I thought, no, 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 nah, no, nah, I'm I can't draw very well on my own. Like I can draw on a computer, but to just sit down and draw or to just sit down and paint, it was very difficult for me because I couldn't take what was in my head and get it exactly like how I visualized it on paper. Um, right. so once the iPad came along and I picked that up with a, uh, an Apple pencil, it was amazing. It Finally, I could just double tap and erase that thing that didn't look like how it looked in my head. <laughs> Um, it's still taken me a while to fully embrace like, no, you are an artist and that is okay. It was almost like I had to give myself permission and not yeah. feel like fraud. Um, so I would definitely tell my younger self, look, you're not just creative. You are you have been creating art in different ways for a very long time. So embrace that and don't mm. just minimize it or... Um, discount what you do just because you draw on a computer or on an iPad, that still doesn't mean you're not creating art. So um, I'm still learning definitely how to loosen up and be more free flowing and, and accept mistakes that I might make and embrace. So um, my goal this winter is to start actually painting and embrace the imperfections that whatever comes out. So I'm going to start, uh, yeah, I've been looking at a couple different different things to try. So that's, oh yeah, that's cool. yeah. Ooh, forthcoming oh. guys. I I I think that is such good advice. And you know, I have a lot of friends, a lot of artist friends that say they get frustrated when they can't draw what they see in their mind, mm-hmm. and and it's held them back at points because mm-hmm. it doesn't come out the way they see it. And and that's right. just a matter of practice, right? Right. right? I also think it's really neat that the iPad liberated you, huh? Oh, it was, yeah, it was a game changer for me. Honestly, I started playing and experimenting with different, um, different ways of drawing. I mean, I was very, my sister always teases me. She's very artistic and uh, she's like, you got to get out of a box. She's like, (laughs) you always are in a box. She's like, you have things you know, evenly spaced or very symmetrical. And she's like, you just got to get out of the box. And so, yeah, I launched a whole new line right after I got the iPad uh, of gouache. Um, It was all these state designs. So I did all the different states and the flora Mm -hmm. and fauna from each state. So Michigan known for their cherries and blueberries, but then they, you know, our white pine is our state tree. And so all those things are in the drawing, the illustration for each state, it's their own flora and fauna. And I don't think I would have done that had I just been working an illustrator on my laptop. So um, yeah, it definitely forced me to start creating differently. So it was, it was very good. Do you do that on canvas? No, I do it literally with gouache brushes in procreate on, uh, on my iPad. Yeah. No way. Yeah. Oh, that's no. cool. I didn't know they had gouache bl- brushes for the iPad. Oh, yeah. There's they, a time. I know they've got different brushes, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Oh. What's your favorite set? Um, I actually use the standard set and I downloaded one 
Lisa Glanz has a lot of really different, very well done brushes. I know she's got watercolor brushes that I'm just starting to play with. Um, and she's got Procreate brushes, or um, I'm sorry, the gouache brushes too. So, um, but even some of the standard ones, they work really well. So, mm. yeah. Interesting. Because when you say gouache, I just think traditional medium. Sure. No, I know. So that's so cool that you're doing I haven't gouache. taken it on yet. No, that's next. I'm looking at acrylic gouache. That's what I want to start playing with in real life off right. the iPad. Um, set up an area in my house and just so I can leave it and come yeah. start and come back to it. I think you have to have a little space set aside for traditional painting where you're not worried about making a mess and you can leave it and it won't get messed up and it can dry a little bit. You're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. So. And that's going to be really challenging. Well, not so much. Our kids just both moved out this year. So um, we have a lot of extra space as empty nesters. So it's a little strange, but it can be good. So yeah, I've got some extra some extra rooms that have great light that I can set up in and leave it. Fantastic. Convert those rooms to an art studio. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. So that leads us to the steps of the appeals system. So the art product presentation, educate and amplify um, automation, licensing and contract terms and success. So let's start with art. How did you come up with this idea? Like, how did you go from being an engineer to being an artist <laughs> and this yeah. idea of pillows and this and that? And yeah, it was unexpected. Uh, we, long story short, it is a long story, but we added onto our house and I had a very large blank wall and um, wanted to fill it and came up with an idea of, and I don't know where it came from. I just thought I need something about our family. And so my kids and husband and I all brainstormed um, just phrases, things that made mm -hmm. us, us places that we would visit, things we would do, things we would say. And I drew all these little hand icons and it's actually right behind me here. Um, oh, is and that the that it became our family bucket list. It was all the things that celebrated us. And I was Aww. invited to an art event in downtown one winter, 10 years ago. And um, I didn't, I was invited to come, but I'm like, I don't have any of my photography framed. I don't have, I don't have anything to bring. And one of my friends said, you've got your canvas, just pull it off the wall and take it down there. So I'm like, well, that's just really, it's not art. And I was still in that <laughs> mind. I mean, this was 10 years ago. So I wasn't I'm right. like, that's not art. And they right. said, yeah, it is. It's very clever and creative and take it down there. You drew everything. So go. So, okay. So I took it. Store owner was a stationary store where I, I was assigned to have my art. And as people wandered through it, everybody loved it. I started creating custom canvases for other families. And then oh. the store owner asked me, she said, have you ever thought about creating something generic enough that I could sell because I love it? And I said, well, I've kind of kicked around this idea for our town and our town is named Grand Haven. So a Grand Haven bucket list. We're not from here originally, but we love and have adopted this town and my kids have been raised here and they she said, do it. I would love it. So I created it. And my background, the a lot of the freelance work that I did was print. And so I created postcards. And she sold out of 100 postcards before the tourist season even started here. So in three wow. weeks, they were gone. So she calls me up. She's like, you have a hit. You need to make more stuff. So I slowly figured out, okay, I can make note card packs and I find, figured out how to print it on a tote bag and got mugs printed and it started to snowball. And by that next year, I had a local mug printer and they could print on fabric and that got the wheels turning because I have, a, I grew up sewing clothes and okay, um, so I thought, oh, I can sew pillows. And so that started and it, I pitched to two other town, two other stores in other towns, um, tourist towns here in West Michigan they took it and then I started having stores in other communities call me and it just, it took off within two years. And um, 
then a department store, Yonkers department stores. It's a regional <laughs> Bonton, Yonkers, Carson, Perry, Scott. It they, sounds very New York. <laughs> uh, no, it's very Midwest. Actually, they're all here in the Midwest. They um, they saw it in a store and they said, we want you to be in our department stores. So over the next two and a half years, I was in over 200 of their stores Wow. And it totally exploded. I had to quit my engineering job and hire people. And it really took off, which was very exciting. And um, it all just started because I had a wall to fill that <laughs> the whole concept. <laughs> and so cool. So it's in, gosh, I've got over 250 different st- state and town designs across the country and parts of Canada. And yeah, mm-hmm. kind of took off. What a great concept. Sometimes yeah. the concept is just the the catalyst, huh? It was. And we didn't, you know, I knew um everything has a shelf life, right? You know, everything has a has a time and um it's not going to last forever and fortunately my husband was super supportive. He was like, "You know what? We don't know how long this is going to last. Just quit your job and go for the ride and see how it goes." And he was right. I mean, I created other designs. I started other lines, obviously, as interest waned with the bucket list. I mean, people, I still just the other day got a request for a custom family bucket list. So oh, the nice. interest is still definitely there, but um, it was it was really great. And um, now it's forced me to start thinking more and dreaming more about other things too. So, which is fun. I think it's fascinating the way art. It- it can evolve. You know, one thing yeah. leads to the next thing, leads to the yeah. next thing. And I think it's really interesting that you started with commissioned work because I have heard from a lot of artists that commission work is like very lucrative or it's a great mm-hmm. way to make the numbers better, right? Sure. And it's something that they kind of get into after they've been doing the art first and like the prints and then the commission kind of comes second as they gain more experience and popularity and, and stuff like that. So I think it's really interesting that you started with the commission work. I it's did. Really cool. And it was kind of funny because I actually stopped the commission work once my business took off because I just couldn't balance doing private commissions and wholesale. And then I started a retail website. I just couldn't do it all. So um, now, as like I said earlier, I've gotten out of manufacturing my own items. I'm still selling wholesale and retail, but now I've started to take on a little more commission work again. Just it make it's nice that it's flexible, but I right. did go at things backwards because I mean, most people, not traditional artists, but I would say makers and in the state here of Michigan, the whole makers space and makers, I don't want to say industry, but the whole, just the whole community of makers has really taken off in the past 10 years. And people, it's more elevated, I would say, than just your, from the past, what people would say an arts and craft show. It's just a higher level. It is art. And most of the makers in Michigan do the circuit of shows. And so they're selling in shows around the state, around the Midwest. Some go out of, out of state. Mm -hmm. Um, And I didn't start that way at all. I literally fell into wholesale because I happened to be at an art event at someone's store. And um, I didn't know anything about selling wholesale whatsoever. And fortunately, the store owner kind of took me under her wing and was like, this is how you price things. And this is how you have to make sure you cover your costs. And here's what a catalog looks like. And I just didn't know any of that. So I soaked it all up. And there was 10 years ago, there was just nothing out on the internet. I couldn't find information at all on how to how to do any of this. So right. totally trial and error went right walking into a retail store with my pitch, <laughs> <laughs> which I shouldn't have done because they're <laughs> focused on customers and found out the hard way, you know, just totally trial yeah. by error yeah. and um, figuring it out. And now it's funny. Now I, I started a retail website like three years after I had already been selling wholesale and mm-hmm. um and then I started doing a couple shows during the year. Just shows are still super valuable from the standpoint of trying and testing new product and seeing a 
public response mm-hmm. and if they like it or not and if your price points and that sort of thing. So they certainly have their place, but wholesale is far more it's worth my time economically and you get more bang for your buck even though you're when I talk with other makers they're like but I have to sell it half off. And I'm like no, you're not selling it half off. When you sell retail, you're actually yeah, you've right. got a much better margin, but um, well, that actually brings us to product and sure. your new wholesale stuff too. So you, I mean, this is a great segue because we're talking about art and how you fell into being an artist, mm-hmm. but you really started with product, which is right. fascinating. And you've mentioned a couple times wholesale versus retail. So can we talk a little bit about the product development cycle oh, for sure. you? I mean, you just mentioned testing product and wholesale. There was so much sure. there that I wanted to like. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, the biggest thing when I started, I mean, and it's, I tried to find, like I said, somebody to print on mugs for me. I've got this design. Hey, I need, I want to see it on a mug. Okay. Find somebody. I didn't end up. I, there were too many restrictions when other people are printing for you. When I was getting tote bags just off of a website, they were printing them. They limited me to this little bitty rectangle. Well, I want it to go to the edge. I want the whole tote bag to have my design on it. So once I started figuring out the limitations and I just thought, I need to start figuring out how I can do this myself. So um, got a mug press that would, you know, an industrial mug press that would do five at a time. And so we would print our own mugs and Super um, cool. found a printer that locally that could print on fabric for me. I started ordering fabric overseas yardage. So we could turn that into pillows and, um, you know, just trying to even figure out, okay, there are, um, Michigan is pretty loose with their maker laws with pillows. You don't have to have product safety tags on them, but other states you do. And so trying to, as you develop, as you actually start to develop your own product, you have to figure out like, what are the requirements? And, um, you know, I finally figured out what's the most economical way to um, use the yardage of fabric to determine what size bag you're going to have or um, Ah. how to help my seamstresses be more productive so they don't have as many pieces to have to put together because the more pieces you have to put together, the longer it takes them and um, then your efficiency goes down and your price goes up. So, and there Mm. are limited people are only going to pay so much for a pillow or a tote bag. So just trying to figure out all those intricacies. I loved that. Actually, that was Mm -hmm, really mm -hmm. fun for me. That's where my engineering project management background kind of came into the picture too. So I enjoyed wearing that hat for sure, but um, really just fell into product development out of necessity because I couldn't get an, a final product that I wanted. So, um, we ramped that up and I did, we manufactured and I had a staff and a production manager and we did all sorts of things. Our, the art prints and the mugs and different size tote bags. And like I said, different size pillows and yeah, we assembled and created pretty much everything. But, um, once COVID hit, it got very difficult and, um, difficult to retain staff. And Mm. then, um, stores weren't ordering consistently and that really all changed. And, um, last year was a great year sales wise. I still did. I actually did better than pre COVID, but it was all in the last six months of the year because so many store owners just weren't, they were holding off waiting to see if it was safe right. to order. and uh, right. trying to manage their inventory. So, um, I did better than previous years, but all in six months instead of spread out over a year. So I was strange burnt out by the end of the year and um, did not have the help that I needed, really needed. So I made- so Jen, yeah. what advice would you give to people who want to develop their own products? Like, um, so there's so many options for designing products now. Sure. 
But and you have so much experience actually designing your own products. There's print on demand. Right. There's do it yourself. There's hire staff. Like you said, you found seamstresses. You bought sure. a mug thing. What tips or advice would you give to somebody who wants to design their own products? Like if people want to only sell retail and design their own products, there's plenty of great print on demand options out there. Again, you there are some limitations on print area, but for the most part, for the average product maker, um, that would be an easy route to start. It would be a great spot to dip your toes in. Um, and to test, right? Too. Right. And to test things out because you don't have to have a ton of inventory. You can set up your website where it will, someone will order something and it'll directly go to that print on demand manufacturer and they'll make it and ship it. So that's easy and you're not dealing with inventory and in which if you have leftover inventory at the end of the year, you pay more in taxes. So um, that is just a great place to start. The problem is with print on demand is it's a higher price point. And so yeah. usually you can't make that work for wholesale. Um, right. There are a few items that you can, um, but like what? Well, like art prints or greeting okay. cards or um, note card packs, usually decals or stickers. You can, you can do that. Um, there are occasionally, if you charge more for your mugs, that's an option. Um, mm -hmm. But I would think you'd have to have really great designs. Just an average design isn't going to warrant a higher price point for that. Right. Mug. Um, right. But like pillows and, you know, my bread and butter, you, you just, people aren't going to pay what it's going to cost to cover your costs for wholesale. Right. Um, and if you want to sell in the stores, you can't use print on demand. No, you could, if you could get your prices correct. But because um, some of the print on demand, you can totally order in bulk and ship okay. it to stores. So that's not the problem. The problem is the price point right. and getting the price to where you are making money and then your store owner can, can double what they pay you for their retail price. Usually that final retail price is so high that people won't, their average customer won't pay it. So right. um, that's why you need to, it's harder to do print on demand. And I haven't been able, I've had to really reduce the number of products I offer for wholesale now that I'm not manufacturing. Mm -hmm. I made that decision and as of January this year, I'm using other print fulfillment companies to fulfill my wholesale orders. And um, yeah, it's just li really limited what you can offer, but it's still possible for sure. So, right. Well, but, and now you're focusing on licensing a lot too, right? That had been my goal since, you know, I first got approached by that company to right? um, license my art. And I went to a conference, Art Biz Jam. That's how I met you. And um, <laughs> it had been recommended to me by another fellow um, business owner here in the West Michigan. And um, she she and I were in a lot of the same stores. So we totally knew each other, had very different styles of art, mm -hmm. um, but we totally knew of each other. And she had recommended it to me. That's how she had started her licensing journey. And I had wanted to grow in that area. So um, after that conference, I landed another licensing contract and thought, okay, I need to, now this is what I need to balance wholesale and retail and licensing. And Ooh. I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. Not at the level that I was for wholesale, the volume, um, plus with all the staffing issues during covid Right. A lot of the responsibility for actually manufacturing fell to me. And so um, I just, I licensing got set aside and it just, it really saddened me because I really wanted to try to grow that part of my business as well. Right. And you hear a lot of people talk about um, diversifying and having different streams of revenue. And um, that's still, it's super important. But I realized I'm like, okay, if I can still sell wholesale and retail, but take out the manufacturing part, then if I can, then I can focus more on licensing as well and doing all three of those well. Whereas before all 
seemed like all of my time had been taken up by the manufacturing part of my business. So right. it was well, time had to be the to, manager had to, yeah, let that go. Well, I wasn't just the manager. I mean, I was the one actually pressing the mugs by the end of last year and Ugh. sewing everything. Right. It, well, I still had my seamstresses, but yeah, um, I ended up physically making a lot of the product myself and I just couldn't, right. didn't want to keep doing that. Right. I had to spend more time on the actual art rather than making the product. Yeah. So P for presentation, you sell into wholesale and you do retail, but presentation is still really important. How do you present your products for shipping and on the shelves? And what advice would you give to people about the importance of presentation? Um, it's, it's hugely important of just for something to have shelf appeal, um, regardless of whether it's sitting on a store shelf or if it's sitting on your table, you're trying to sell it at a market. Um, mm -hmm. so, so either way your packaging and how you show off your product and its features is super important. And I don't think a lot of people, when they first start off, don't think about that. I right. thought about a little more just because I came from a print background. I started on a newspaper. That was how I got my toes in the water with freelancing. Really? Yeah. When I was in college studying to be an engineer, actually, I started on the staff of the uh, university newspaper and was on their ad staff. And so created ads and that's how I learned Photoshop. And at that time it wasn't <laughs> Illustrator, it was uh freehand um, or and, Corel and well, and Quark Express <laughs> later I went to Corel. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's where I came from. And so just had the whole print. I started doing a lot of freelance for local nonprofits. And so I could design my own packaging and, um, and it was less expensive. I didn't have to pay somebody else to do it. And so that was a huge advantage so I think, and I notice a lot of makers here, at least in our community, they don't have that capability. They have to mm. pay somebody else. And so that takes a back burner um, or they don't even do it at all. Um, or they'll just try to make little things themselves and they don't think about um, just trying to elevate and make your packaging look professional to help elevate right. your product it's more than just slapping a sticker on it or a tag. Um, yeah. and, and sometimes it's actually, it's more than just descriptive packaging. It's practical. Um, mm. I found once I went um, in the department stores, so I was in several, they started me off on a couple dozen department stores before they launched me into all of them. And um, I sold sets of felt coasters. They were a set of four. And I had this cute little um, strap of paper, basically, that went around them. Okay. Well, there were four different designs. And so invariably, what I found out later and what the store manager found out um, was that people would take them out and look at them to see the different designs. And if they didn't want oh. them, then they would just leave them sitting there and it would be separated from its packaging because it really wasn't a package. It was a belly band that wrapped around the coasters. Okay. So she said, you've got to do something different for the packaging. Otherwise we're not going to be able to carry these anymore. Okay. So I figured out, okay, what's going to be helpful to show these off in the best light. So I had them in a bag, um, a clear cellophane bag and had a folded over sealed. Um, okay. Of paper printed, you know, really nicely printed, described what it was on the back though, instead of having just the skew and the barcode, I actually put the four different designs that were included in the package. So people still would not feel the need to open the package and see what they were. Right. Instead, now they can at a glance, see what the four designs are. It was far more pain in the butt to do because I was designing for dozens of different locations. So, okay. but it was important that it looked right and it made sense for the retailer to carry. It also allowed okay. them with, with a hole in it, they could hang them up. They didn't have to try to figure out some sort of, they would flop if they just sat on a shelf. 
Right. So instead of them having to figure out some sort of basket to put them in, they could hang them on a, on a hanging hook as, as well. And so thinking of like, how is this going to sit on a shelf? How is this going to be seen is super important um, because otherwise they just won't sell as well and you won't make as much money. Your retailer won't make as much money. So, um, and like you said, the retailer might not even carry you. Right. Right. Or they'll stop yeah. carrying that particular item just because it, it doesn't, they don't have a good way to, to display it. Right. So, and I went to a packaging, um, presentation at a conference I was at for Astra and they had a packaging designer, two of them presenting. And it was really interesting to hear them talk. And they were asking retailers in the room and they were very adamant that if a product had bad packaging, like it would constantly fall over on the shelf or it was really heavy and dangerous to the customer or or people were taking it out of the product and they couldn't tell right. what it was, they'd stop carrying it. I was like, right. oh my gosh, wow. Yep. Though I did have one advantage with having the retailer that kind of took me under her wing and she and I became good friends. And so she was a great test for me to see yeah. um, how things would work. But even then I miss, cause she had carried my coasters for a while it was different than when it was in a department store, a much larger store where right. the store owner isn't right there. Um, so even that trying to think bigger than what I had been thinking was, it was a good lesson for me to make yeah. me and reevaluate all of my product packaging to see that it would work in all situations. Fantastic advice. Fantastic. Um, so We've done art, we've done product, we've done presentation. How about E for educate and educating your audience? I really use this terminology to kind of encompass the idea of marketing hmm. and educating your audience with marketing. I, I want to bring up your blog. Hmm. And sure. I love the advice you and I talked about the other week. Um, you gave me some really, really wonderful things to think about with the process that you use for tackling social media and sure. blogging. Yeah. So what do you think are some great tips or tricks for the audience about um, educating your audience and marketing? Particularly with my original product line, the bucket list, um, at first glance, a lot of times people didn't get it. They didn't, they didn't really know what it was about. Um, even though at the bottom of every bucket list, it's got the name of the town or the state. It's uh -huh. got the major icon that represents that town or state. If people didn't catch that, it took them a minute. And sometimes they didn't stand there a whole minute. So <laughs> with my packaging um, and then also putting it out on social media, but then as I attracted followers and people wanted to follow along on my blog and my e-newsletter, having to talk about that um, became really important. Right. Um, I couldn't depend on like if my store owner got it and knew what it was and they were right there to help sell it. Great. No problem. They would just say, oh, it's a bucket list of all the fun things to do in our town. Done. Yeah. You know, then, then everybody understands it. Oh, that's great. But when you're in bigger stores or you don't have a store owner that's got the same buy-in and excitement, um, or you're in a department store, there isn't somebody there to right. say that. So one, your packaging really needs to help boil that down in a very quick, glanceable way that people can get it then. But then once, as you were saying, once I started attracting followers, um, I was encouraged to start blogging. Um, my sister is in marketing and she's like, you've got to start a blog. And I just thought, nobody cares. Like, who cares to hear from me? And she's like, hey, that's what Joanna Gaines said too. And everybody loves to hear what she has to say, but people want to know. So even for any artist that's out there that's listening right now, if you don't think you have a whole lot to say, I didn't either, but I am shocked still to this day I'll do markets or I'll be in town and people say, oh, you, you're tandem for two. Like they don't, might not know my name, but they know my company and they are thrilled to meet me and will remember something about my, that I've written. I just got an email the other day where 
a woman responded to my e-newsletter. She literally hit reply and emailed me back and thanks so much for sharing this and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, it still amazes me. And I'm (laughs) humbled by it, honestly, that people are like thrilled to know the artist behind what's being created. And I think about that. I'm like, well, I am too. When I meet other people, I'm interested in their story and their process. And so why wouldn't people be that way with me too? And to accept that and just realize that. So once I was, once I started blogging, I literally will sit down um, and once a month on a day, I take that day and I'll write uh, three to four blog posts for the month. And I'll turn those into, I put them on my blog. I create a graphic for them and I put them on my blog and schedule them to be released on my blog. But then I take those exact same things that I've written. I'm going to reuse it because I'm not going to rewrite everything again. So I take that exact same blog post and put parts of it in e-newsletters for them. Mm -hmm. If I've written four blog posts, then I'm writing four e-newsletters and I'll put other things in as well. But that forms the bulk of my email and I'll schedule that out all on the same day. So I've got this done usually by noon. I've got the blog post written and scheduled. And then from there with the graphics that I've created, I'll pin them to Pinterest and then I'll take the photos that I used in those graphics and I'll use those in my social media posts um, to Facebook and Instagram, and I'll talk about those same things. So um, reusing that content is a huge time saver. And then I can set it and forget it. It, Once I've got it scheduled that day for the next month, that month's done. I don't have to worry about that month then. I love it. You can do that with your social media posts too. I did that religiously for quite a while, for several years, where I would have um, two months scheduled ahead of time for Mm -hmm. social media as well. And um, I've fallen away from that just because of the way the algorithms changed. And I'm not as crazy fanatic about posting as, as often as I was. So um, that you have to find like what works for you too. Yeah. I love it though. You're batch processing. You're, you're making a whole batch of blog posts and emails and graphics all at the same time. Right. And then, you know, using it as there's this concept of macro to micro content, which I think is really interesting. You mm-hmm. know, this idea of creating a big piece the big and then pieces. taking little, mm-hmm. yeah, little yeah. pieces and putting them out there. So right. that's fantastic. And I think it really helps with the anxiety and the overwhelm and the frustration. Well, and honestly, it helps. Uh, I'm a planner. So it helps me, especially coming into summer. I know I'm going to be busy in the summer. Oh, I'm going yeah. to vacations. I'm going to want downtime. So in May, if I can crank out a couple months worth in right. two, two days, heck yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to force myself to sit down and just do it because then <laughs> I don't have to worry about in the middle of the summer. Oh, shoot. I didn't write a blog. You know, I, oh my gosh, an email's not going out, whatever. So, right. um, And that regular, consistent communication with our customers, um, it's so important. And I get sales off of those emails when I, not every single email, but um, because I don't put my products for sale, you know, in the email, in every single week. I figure that's Mm. too fast. Um, So I give them information. I give them storytelling behind the scenes. And then twice a month, I'll, in a sense, make an ask. I'll put, hey, here's some new products that are up on the website, or here's my sale page. And, you know, here's some products that you might be interested in that are on sale. And every time I do that, I make sales every single time. So um, people will click through on the blog post. They'll click Uh through my website. That's great. And occasionally I'll get a sale that way. But um, when I actually specifically put products that are for sale at the bottom of the newsletter, then they, they click through and I will get several sales. So, um, great advice that can, that consistent, um, not asking all the time, you know, giving them information, entertaining them with behind the scenes and stories and process. And because all of my 
art is um, seasonal or location based, um, celebrating where we live. Um, I'll do little mini travelogues and give mm. them information. So if they want to visit this place, then here's all the things to do places that I've been or that I'm planning to go. So I've researched them. So being helpful. So I'm not just always asking, Hey, can you buy this? You know, we're not just asking, we're giving as well. That's pretty important. I think. Yeah. Fantastic advice. So I actually, this transitions really well into automation. You know, there's so many hats like you were talking about to wear as an artist and a business owner and an entrepreneur. And um, so by batch processing and educating your audience and then batch processing, that leads us to automation. What are your, some of your favorite tips or tricks for getting more done mm. without being overwhelmed? Uh, I haven't cracked that code completely yet. <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> Nobody uh, has. That's why I ask it. Yeah. Well, the one area, the 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 one area of automation, the batch processing for my blog post, that's huge. That has been a game changer once I started doing that several years ago. Another thing that I do automatically, and it's just it's a healthy, it's a healthy thing to do. I have run into so many makers and artists that they don't pay themselves. They just, ah. they, they just don't, they don't think about it or they just, oh, I've got money in the account. I must be doing well. Um, they don't necessarily keep up with their books or they'll do, they'll keep up with their books quarterly or they'll let it slide till, oh, I'll be less busy in the fall, you know, like that sort of thing. Obviously my husband does my books, so that helps me, but he still doesn't always do them timely. So I'm still going in and I'm look, pulling my profit and loss sheet. And I'm looking at the balance sheet for that month. But I read um, Mike McCallowitz, his book, Profit First. I read mm. it probably three, four years ago. Um, and that changed the way that I look at um, my business in paying myself. I realized mm. that I was just like everybody else that I was just, oh, I've got money in the account. I must be fine. Or at the end of the year, hey, we've got extra, great, I can splurge and buy this thing, or I can just roll it back over into the business, which so many of us do, and we don't even think about it, and we're not oh, yeah. an actual salary. And so I sat down, once I read his book, I thought, all right, I need to change the way I'm doing this, because otherwise, this is just a glorified hobby. Mm. And I want to say that again, because... I think so many of us think, okay, no, I'm a professional. I have a professional art business or I'm a maker and I'm no, if you're not paying yourself, it's a hobby mm. and which <laughs> that's horrible. I'm spending a ton of time and busting my butt. And so are other people and it's way more than a hobby, but if we're not paying ourselves, then it might as well be. So mm. I literally sat down and evaluated my whole business according the way he outlined it in his book. And you look at your balance sheet and you figure out, okay, what's the percentage of your overhead that you've spent every year? You look back historically. So you figure out your average overhead, you figure out your average, you know, you know, your, your costs. And I don't mean by product. I mean, we're looking big level at the whole business. And I realized, and he's got guidelines for like what a healthy overhead percentage should be. And I can guarantee for just about everybody, we're spending way more on our overhead than we probably should be. So figuring that out and have, realizing, okay, if I have more going towards overhead and I've got tax, if you know, how many of us don't account for paying for our taxes? You know, some of us maybe set aside a budget, but a lot of people don't. And I was included in that. So actually showing like, no, I need the, you know, 5% set aside for taxes or, you know, whatever that percentage is figuring that out. And so then I knew every month my operating expenses should be in this percentage range. My overhead is, you know, part of that, my taxes, um, all of those different percentages. And then I need to have 5% profit built in. 
I need to have 20% paid to myself Mm. separate from profit. Profit is what you're allowed to pour back into the company or allowed to buy fun new iPads and toys to do your job well. Or you could profit share. You can give bonuses to your employees or to yourself. But you still should have a salary built in that's totally separate from that. So Mm. once I figured out those percentages based on what I was spending my operating expenses and what my overhead was, I literally at the end of every month would look at how much money had come in for that month, divvy it up into those percentages. And I had bank accounts. I still do have bank accounts associated with each of those. So I have Mm -hmm. a tax bank account. I have an, you know, a salary account. I have, you know, you have your account and I would, whatever income had come in that month, I would divvy it up into those separate accounts. And then actually the profit I would let sit there till the end of the year, till I decide what to do with it. But my salary Mm -hmm. account, I transferred that over to my personal bank account every month. And it got to the point where it made me look forward. I was so excited about that part of accounting. I was excited about accounting other than accounting, (laughs) honestly, but it made me excited and looking forward to, oh, I'm actually making money. I'm going to get paid. I'm going to get paid. And, you know, yes, it totally varies over the course of the year, depending on the month you're in. Some months I'm busier wholesale. Some I'm Mm -hmm. like, if you're licensing, you know that that's a long game. So it's totally, totally different for different times of the year. But um, man, that was a game changer for me. And I've been talking to other makers. I've been selling, um, I've been selling a wholesale course. And that's one of the first things I talk about is we have to pay ourselves. So yeah. automating that, making that an automatic thing every month, um, game changer for my business made me excited about that aspect of my business when normally a lot right. of kind of cringe and just don't want to deal with it. Yeah. So that was, yeah, making it an automatic thing in my business was definitely a huge improvement. Very so, cool. Very cool. Well, that leads us to licensing and contract terms. And I do want to hear more about your wholesale course here too. So oh, sure. Yeah. Tell us a little bit um, with licensing and contract terms. What are some of the most important licensing and contract terms you'd like to share with people or lessons? Um, I had a really hard lesson earlier this year in, in regards to this. I had... Um, cold called on a company that I admired and I really liked and knew some of their products. And um, the woman responded back to me and got back to me and was very excited about my art and my, my portfolio style. And so she said, could you design from briefs? Well, sure. Absolutely. Give me a narrowed down, you know, whatever it is, the information they would have their larger retailers say, Hey, we're looking for this kind of art in this colorway, this many pieces, this is what we're looking for. So I thought, okay. yeah, do that. So she gave me first example to do and, um, you know, no contract yet. This was just, Hey, try this out, see if it works. Sure. Cause if it didn't, I could add it to my portfolio. I wasn't too worried about it. Okay. So, um, did she wanted six to eight pieces of art had, you know, specifications, the audience of who it was to reach. And so I did it to their specs and, um, she's like, this is fantastic. You knocked it out of the park. They're going to be very excited about it. I'm going to get you a contract and can you do more? Would you like to continue with us? Absolutely. So got the contract to me and, um, I didn't realize that who their parent company was. And so the it, the contract was the, with the parent company, but I knew who that parent company was. So I'm reading over the contract and I realized, and I took me, I couldn't believe it. I wanted to make sure I wasn't reading it incorrectly, but they basically did not have a length of term to the contract. So I thought, Uh-oh. okay, if there's no length of term, okay, I can deal with that. But how do you terminate? the relationship then and and what happens with the art. So I'm 
reading with that in mind. And they said, you know, either party could terminate in writing. That's pretty standard. But it said that any art that had been created for them, even if it never got licensed, any art that had been created, you know, based on their specs that they gave you would remain in their, not, they didn't use the word property, but it would remain in their vault in a sense and could potentially be licensed into perpetuity forever. So even though further in the contract, it said that the, the um, artist holds the copyright, absolutely. The artist should always right. hold the copyright. Yeah. But okay, if I hold the copyright, but you don't have a length to the contract of where it ends. And you're telling me that my art is going to stay anything I've created for you guys, even if it's not ever licensed out, it's going to stay available to you forever per- in perpetuity. That means forever. Yeah. And I have no way to get that out or back so that I can use it and license it elsewhere. Then right. it doesn't matter if I hold the copyright because you've just hijacked me and hijacked my art. Right. It kind of overrides it. Right. So I couldn't believe that they literally had this in their contract. And so I thought, this has got to be a mistake. I must be reading this wrong because they have dozens and dozens of artists that create for them. I mean, you look at their website, dozens. And I just thought, this is, I must be wrong. And so I'm asking questions and no, I really, I'm rereading and I'm not interpreting this incorrectly. So I said, okay, I will sign your contract, but I need some things changed. I either need a term like three years, that's pretty average for licensing. Mm -hmm. So I either need a length that this is good for. And then after that, we're done. Our Mm -hmm. relationship is done. Or, um, you take out the part that says in perpetuity, so you don't right. have my art forever that when the contract is terminated by either party, then our relationship is terminated. Um, they wouldn't do it. Their legal department wouldn't change it. Mm. They said through this, um, my contact, the legal, she let me know that the legal department said that they'd never had any issues before. She basically insinuated that I um, wasn't, experienced enough to know (laughs) she got a little condescending. And I said, you know, I have two other contracts right now with some of the largest companies in the gift industry. And luckily I had just signed a contract just previous for 32 SKUs with another company. And, um, and I just said, I'm with some of the largest and their contracts are pretty similar, pretty standard. And yeah. no one asks to keep art accessible to them only in perpetuity. Right. Ever. Ever. And no other contract have I encountered doesn't have a length of contract, doesn't have a term set to it. Right. It expires and can be renewed. And your unwillingness to do that is a deal breaker for me. And I had to walk away and I was really bummed because they were ready to license these six to eight pieces yeah, and had already given me a proposed spec to do another set of artwork. And it was, and I was really (sighs) second guessing myself because so many other artists had signed the same contract. So it made me second guess myself, made me second guess. Am I really reading this right? Am I really, or am I being too particular No, it sounds to me like they've taken advantage of a lot of other artists who didn't know. And that's, and then to make you feel like, right. You didn't know. I'm not experienced enough. Yeah. Dude, that's like gaslighting. It totally was. (laughs) It totally was. I had to, it really kind of shook me for a while. And I thought, no, I know that that's not okay. And I'm not going to give in just because I really want the licensing contract. I mean, licensing right now is hard. It's yeah. the whole industry, just like wholesale. There's been a lot of demands on with supply chain and with a lot of demands on stores, with the economy. And um, mm-hmm. so 
contracts are harder to come by. And so I could see how it would would be really easy for artists to just kind of give in and go with it because they want the contract. And I don't blame them at all, but um, just, I guess my point is, and my advice is to to really read those contracts and really pay attention to the details and really make sure that you are being protected, not just the contractor. Thank you so much for sharing that story. I think it's a really powerful and good story. And to recap, you guys, look for terms like in perpetuity, which means Mm -hmm. forever Forever. and look and make sure that there's a clause about length of the contract when it terminates. That is standard. Look for terms like exclusivity um, and region. This was worldwide exclusivity. And I thought worldwide are, exclusivity worldwide. in perpetuity. In so perpetuity. Other words, oh my God. <laughs> and it was every category. It was everything. Oh my God. So it was just so funny to me. I just thought, okay, you know what? I can handle worldwide and I can handle even every category because it was to their specs. It wasn't something that I normally would have dreamed up on myself. It wasn't like I was pulling it out of my existing portfolio. So I'm like, you know okay. what? I'm okay with that. If there's a length of time to it, if it's right. three years, I can live with that. But forever, no, because right. it could sit in their vault for their salespeople to access to pitch the stores forever, and it might not ever get licensed. Mm. So that what you created is just sitting there locked up, and you're not able to use it with anyone else in a jail. <laughs> Right. So watch out for those terms, guys. Those are big right. red flags. Super Exclusivity, important. in perpetuity, worldwide. Those are big right. red flags. Watch for them. Yeah. Um, especially if they're all in combination. <laughs> like they <laughs> if they're all together. Yes. Oh, my God. All right. So success, S for success. How hmm. do you measure success? Um, I think it kind of comes back to what you were saying earlier about how we don't pay ourselves. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of tacked this on after I came up with the acronym, after I'd been doing this for a little while and organizing the materials I'd gotten and seeing the pattern. Mm-hmm. And then I went, wait a minute, we need some measurements for success here. <laughs> how do you measure success? How do you celebrate it? Um, and reward yourself? Um, It's a great question. For sure, like we talked about paying yourself, (laughs) that's a great reward (laughs) at the end of each month for how hard you've worked to make sure that you're not just pouring it back into your business, but paying yourself. Um, I think that's a good measure of success. But in hand in hand with that, um, the amount of money that everybody measures that differently. And um, I guess my uh, evaluation or definition of what success is has changed over the past year after getting completely burnt out. Sure. I was paying myself every month and I was paying myself a lot because my business was super successful. It has had surpassed my 2019 sales. I was six figures in sales. So sure. Looking on paper, looking on paper and looking at everything, you think, okay, that's successful. That is a successful wholesale and retail business. But I was completely burnt out and was still having trouble hiring someone to work enough hours to, so that I didn't have to manufacture that I could have someone um, in that production role and in that fulfillment role. And the thought of training someone yet again to, mm-hmm. to do that for me after I had, you know, done that for years, um, I just, it wasn't fun anymore. And I, mm-hmm. as hard as it was to, to pivot and to change direction in my business and to let go of manufacturing, because I knew if I let go of manufacturing, it meant I could not sell most of my products wholesale because finding a print fulfillment or print on demand, the price was not going to work out for those products for me to sell. Right. Them I could still sell them retail, which I do, um, right. but I wasn't going to be able to offer them wholesale. And that was a hard pill to swallow because 
I mean, like that meant my pillows. I wasn't, these are my baby. I mean, this was, this is what launched my really launched and made my business grow. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't going to be able to sell them in stores anymore. Um, Mm -hmm. I could sell them on my own website. That was fine. But um, so I knew what letting go of manufacturing myself meant. Um, But my measure of success had changed. I wanted more, a better quality of life and not be run so ragged and not being able to, to be home as much. And, um, even though my kids, it was funny timing because both of my kids moved out this past year. And so just the timing of life, but I wasn't being able to sit down and create art nearly as much as I had hoped and planned on. Right. Uh, So to make that change, that's been a measure of success for me. Um, this summer was wonderful. I literally <laughs> got to get up every morning and go out with my coffee on my porch and sit with my dog and draw all morning and right, and ride that bike and ride the tandem bike downtown. Yep. But it just, I had not had the freedom to do that any other year of my business to be able to mm. literally, I would draw and create Usually I'd cram it in on the weekends um, or at night watching television with my husband. I would sit there and and draw just because I didn't have enough time during the day because I was running (sighs) all the other details of my business. And then at first, honestly, the beginning of this year, I felt a little guilty, like (laughs) just sitting here drawing all day for four, six, eight hours, like okay, should I be doing something? You know, you don't feel productive because productivity looked different than what it had before. So it took me several months to kind of make that um, mindset shift and give myself permission. No, it's okay. This is, it looks different, but it doesn't mean you're any less successful. So Mm. it might take, well, not might, it will. I mean, the licensing is much longer term. You know, I pitched art in February and drew additional pieces with it and got like, you know, the contract signed midsummer. And I won't see those products actually made until next January, February. And I won't see a check from any of it until next April. If, you know, the first yeah. quarter goes well, it's, it's a very year and a half. That's pretty normal. And I knew that going in. You're Um, beholden to somebody else's timeline and schedule. When you're your own maker, you can make it and get it out there much faster. And that's just the nature of the beast. Right. So looking at my bank account, I'm not paying (laughs) myself nearly what I was last year every month. So does that mean I'm not a success? No, I would have four to six hours to draw. I it's just a different mindset shift. So I think for measures of success, um, it changes with the season of life we're in. It changes with what our goals are um, Mm -hmm. and our goals can change. So I don't think it can look the same for anyone. Um, And so figuring out what is going to make you feel successful. And I don't mean success as in like the stereotype of making a lot of money. I mean, what is going to balance your life? I have a much better life balance now. I am much right. more relaxed. Um, my dog is certainly happier that I'm home all day with him. <laughs> <laughs> but I see friends more and I'm, you know, investing more time with my husband. And um, yeah, it just depends on what your measure of success is. Well, thank you for sharing that because sure. I think it's important that we talk about it mm-hmm. and openly share that exactly that, that the measurement for success can be different for everybody, but you do have to define it. You do have to look at it and decide what it is for you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. You have shared so much stuff. We didn't even get to your wholesale class. So tell us real quick about where and what you're doing with that and where people can get your products too. Like if Um, my products, so pillows and mugs and tea towels and art prints, note cards, that's all at tandemfor2.com. It's 
T-A-N-D-E-M-F-O-R-T-W-O.com. Um, and there's my blog on there. You can read up, get travel ideas, um, destination ideas, and I've got designs for all different states and towns um, and seasons. Have you um, done Harrisburg, Pennsylvania? I've done Pennsylvania. I haven't done Harrisburg, but yeah. You should do have, Hershey. That would be fun. That would be fun. I've got, it, it's on, Hershey is on my uh, state. Sorry. It's on your bucket list. (laughs) It is on the state bucket list. So, but my whole, the wholesale class, I started um, two years ago, three years ago now. I started in 2020. Um, I was going to be giving a seminar for local businesses, for other makers and COVID hit. So we weren't able to do that. And so I just started that summer writing down an outline of information that I would share. Well, it started snowballing and it turned into 70 pages of information. Mm -hmm. I turned it into all that happens. It just (laughs) snowballed. There was so much information that I wanted to share when I started, like I explained earlier in the podcast, when I started 10 years ago, there just wasn't information out there. Uh, when I went to go to my first gift show, how do you build a temporary booth and get it there? And like, I had no idea and yeah, didn't find anything out, you know, just Googling. No. There's just wasn't the information out there. There's a, there is more now there's different courses you can take. Um, a couple other businesses are now doing that, but I didn't find any that were specifically tailored towards makers people who had started in the gift show circuit and going to different markets and arts and craft shows, and they made the product themselves. Um, So I just didn't find information geared towards people like that. So I put this workbook together, it's five modules, and I started a mastermind. And I've had Gosh, I've had probably close to 20 students that have gone through. I keep it intentional, more than 20, because I keep it um, three to four students per mastermind. So I keep it really small so that we Mm -hmm. can really work one on one within the, and it's a Zoom call once a week for five weeks. Um, And we all three or four together, or is it like you said, one on one? No, it's all three or four of us together, but I'm accessible for one-on-one throughout the whole five weeks. Um, People can hire me for consulting for Mm one-on-one for an hourly basis, but the mastermind itself, it's a group together because it helps to see, we go through the nitty gritty. We go through pricing. We make sure that their products are priced right. We go through marketing. We make sure that... um, they have to write example emails. And so then we go through them together as a group. And I make sure that there's not competing businesses. Oh, okay. Mastermind. We all have to sign an NDA. So what is disclosed in the, um, during the mastermind stays in the mastermind. (laughs) So, um, everyone learns how to price their product, how to make sure they're making money, how to pay themselves, how to market themselves, how to all the how-tos of wholesaling. We talk about gift shows if they get to that point. Yeah. What that costs and what goes into that. And I literally, I have it, my whole marketing strategy, cold calling, the thing that everybody hates, but I have learned to love it because retailers are just people like us too. And we're trying to help them. They need product for their stores. So we're helping yeah. them, we're not bothering them. So all of those, um, the things that I learned all the hard way, yeah, I, mean, I spell it all out and um, really help businesses refine themselves, make sure their product is ready to sell wholesale, but make sure that their business is set up to sell wholesale to grow. Because yeah. I have found wholesale has really been a growth change that's been the biggest change in my business is selling wholesale. That's where I've seen the increase in my business. So I also started offering just as of this year, that same workbook outside of the mastermind. So if someone wanted to work through it themselves at their own pace, they totally can. Um, Some people need the accountability and want more of the the three-on-one, but um, some people don't, they just want the workbook. And so I offer that. And then I started offering. bundles 
that basically it's a pricing spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. I've got a marketing bundle with examples of email templates so they can literally Mm -hmm. change their information and copy and paste the, the emails and marketing. And, um, yeah, I've got all these different add-ons that people can, um, opt for if they want, and just to make it easier for them to go through this process. So fantastic. So where do we get it? Jen Smelks Design, J-E-N-S-M-E-L-K-S design.com. So fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I think I need some of those resources. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for uh, just your time and asking great questions. And this has been really fun. Of course. I mean, the whole point is to get the information out there, right? Right. Right. That's why you started the mastermind. That's why I started the podcast. Yep. I want it wasn't out there. Learn, right. And other people to not have to make the same mistakes. Oh yeah. For real. For real. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for being on and uh, Thanks, Aaron. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Have a great day. <laughs>